please. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for your time and effort this afternoon. My name is Ben Jessam. I'm the MLA from Hammonds Plains Lucasville, and I am the chair of this health committee. Uh, this is our first uh, virtual health meeting. We, we went through community services this morning relatively uh, well. I uh, expect more of the same. Thank you to our, our friends at Ledge TV and our clerk's office for helping us to make this possible. Uh, today, we have uh, Dr. Stephen Bede uh, here to present to the committee on the ongoing work uh, with respect to organ and tissue donation. Mr. Uh, Dr. Bede, thank you for being here today. Just a couple of uh, small housekeeping items. Uh, reminder as always for folks to keep their, their phones on silent. Uh, they'll be close by today and uh, ask everybody to, to mute them or put them uh, on a setting that won't disrupt. Um, staff that are not members or um, are going to are going to be uh, they're going to have their screens uh, turned off and their their volume muted. I'd ask that all members and speakers, when they are not speaking, uh, to mute their um, hit their mute option while other people are speaking. Um, we're going to make an effort for folks not to leave the meeting if necessary. Leave your uh, your visual on uh, to the best of your ability. Um, at some point, uh, if I need to confer with uh, uh, legislative staff, uh, I may call for a brief recess. Uh, we'll play that by ear. Uh, if anybody has any um, technical issues ongoing, I'd ask you to reach out to myself or Ms. Cavanaugh. And I think that I've hit um, everything. I know I'll, I'll note that Dr. Bede had a an additional item that he wishes to submit to the committee uh, based on some statistics, excuse me, that might come up over the course of the meeting. So that mightn't be in your hand right now, but that will be soon to follow. And at this point, I think that I will begin with uh, some introductions, starting with uh, Mr. Horn, please. Bill Horn. MLA for Waverly Fall River Beaver Bank, and I welcome Dr. Steve B. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Horn. Ms. Coombs? Yeah. Good afternoon, Kendra Coombs, Cape Breton Center, and welcome. Ms. Adams? Good afternoon. I'm Barbara Adams, the MLA for Cool Harbor Eastern Passage, and I welcome you to this afternoon's session. Mr. LeBlanc. Good afternoon. My name is Colton LeBlanc. I am the MLA for Argyle Barrington, and thank you very much for joining us today. Ms. LeBlanc. Hi there, Sue LeBlanc, MLA for Dartmouth North. Welcome. Ms. D. Costanzo. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Rafa Di Costanzo, MLA for Clayton Park West, and I am so excited to hear the updates on this uh, amazing issue. Thank you. Progressive issue. Thank you. Ms. Miller, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Margaret Miller. I'm the MLA for Hans East, and certainly this is one of my favorite subjects as well, so we'll have a further conversation later. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Mr. Irving, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Keith Irving, MLA for King South. Thank you, folks. And we're also joined by Mr. Gordon Hebb and Ms. Judy Cavanaugh, who will be supporting the efforts of today's meeting. Thank you, folks, for being here as well. Uh, without further ado, um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Bede, uh, who's in his scrubs, I can see, um, to give some opening remarks. And then we'll open the floor to uh, some Q&A. Please and thank you, Mr. Or Dr. Bede. Please proceed. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to this committee. I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss what I think is a pretty exciting project. And, and, uh, and I am coming from the hospital where I'm covering the ICU. So you're wearing your business attire and to some extent I'm wearing mine. 
So uh, I will uh, I will ask your indulgence as I sit here in my pajamas while you sit here wearing a tie. I will um, I will take a few minutes with some opening remarks and then I look forward to having a conversation with uh, with you as we discuss this topic. So in terms of the uh, the uh, sort of formal remarks, I'd like to uh, I'd like to start first of all by by uh, introducing myself. I'm I'm Steve Bead. I am an adult intensive care physician at the Queen Elizabeth II Health Sciences Center. For about 15 years, I have been the medical director of the Nova Scotia Organ uh, Donation Program here uh, in Nova Scotia, and I'm very pleased to have the chance to, to meet with the committee. As you well know, the Human Organ and Tissue Donation Act, which comes into effect in January 18th of 2021, will improve the health care for Nova Scotians by making it possible for more Nova Scotians to donate their organs and tissues at the time of their death. Organ and tissue donation, I would be happy to argue, is much more important than many of us realize uh, for the effect on the people and the family it directly affects and for our society. In Nova Scotia, at any given time, there are about 100 people waiting for an organ transplant so that they can live a healthier and more productive life. And for some of them, receiving this organ is literally a matter of life and death. People with end-stage organ failure suffer on a daily basis. They're living difficult lives while they await a transplant. Some will become too sick to actually qualify for a transplant. Others will die while awaiting that that life-saving intervention. It's important to note that, that almost all of these people who are on the wait list have acquired disease rather than congenital disease. They, at some point, saw themselves as healthy until they got sick. We cannot know our future, so this could be the fate for any one of us as we sit here in apparent good health. And I would argue that if, if this is to be our fate, wouldn't we want to be supported by a system that increases the chance that an organ or tissue is available if we needed it? It's important to note that, and this is Canadian data, it's about six times more likely in your lifetime that you will need an organ than it is that you would become a donor. So as we sit here thinking about our futures, we can say that it is a lot more likely that you might find yourself in need of that life-saving organ, or certainly the people in your circle. We also know that thousands of Nova Scotians are benefiting from tissue transplantation every year. A tissue donation from a single donor who can donate bone, skin, heart valves, tendons, corneas, that can renew or save the life for up to 75 people. The patients that benefit clearly burn patients, children with heart valve problems, the visually impaired, and many, many people with orthopedic and mobility uh, problems are examples of patients who can benefit from tissue donation and transplantation. Tissue donation can be life-saving, but it's always life-changing. It's important to think about this in a broader lens. When families make the decision to donate, their neighbors directly benefit. Last year, there were 53 Nova Scotians who received organ transplants and more than a thousand received tissue. So donation is obviously affecting the recipients, but it's also affecting their families and their friends, their colleagues and acquaintance who love and support them. The benefit from their renewed life and improved health after transplant is obvious to a broad circle. This seems like the obvious reason for why I'm supporting this, but it's actually not what motivated me to support the development of this program. I help take care of critically ill patients in the intensive care unit, and the care of these patients obviously must include care for their families. Patients who become donors have almost always had a very sudden catastrophic injury to their brain. The people who become donors have severe trauma like a car accident, bleeding from a stroke or a, an aneurysm, 
or lack of oxygen, like after a heart attack, if their heart would have stopped. So in these circumstances, their families saw them as healthy just hours before we meet them in the ICU to discuss a devastating illness. These families are scared, they're overwhelmed, they're exhausted as the trajectory of their loved one's illness is defined, but sometimes there is no medical therapy that can change the injury and patients unfortunately will die. The families dealing with this sudden loss are devastated. And the question, can anything positive come from a terrible tragedy uh, is raised. Organ and tissue donation can have a powerful positive effect on those families in the midst of dealing with their tragedy. Now we shared with this committee a video of Kelly Patterson who lost her son Stephen in a traffic in a tragic car accident. The decision to donate Stephen's organs helped Kelly through a very dark period in her life. And this gift of life not only impacted the recipient, but fathers, husbands, wives, mothers, daughters, sounds, sons, countless others in that circle who were given a second chance because of the decision that was made. Now, clinically, I see people of all ages and backgrounds who become recipients and donors. They donate organs, eyes, tissues. Lives are transformed and donor families can turn a terrible loss into some hope. The gift and the benefit their loved ones provide to other families can assist in their experience of grief, knowing the lives that they've saved. This may not lessen the pain of the grieving process, but it gives families some comfort knowing the last gift their loved one made was saving and changing the life of somebody else. That's the reason I tried to support donation. The anonymous recipient is not my patient, but the patient in front of me and their families deserve optimal end of life care and offering them the gift of donation is, is part of that. I've just lost my screen. Am I still connected? You're still, uh, we can still see, uh, I can still see you and um, well, I can hear you, Dr. Bede. Good, because I, I think I'm just having computer problems here. In any case, that's the reason that I got involved with, with doing this. It's the reason that I try to support donation. The anonymous recipients, not my patient, but the patient in front of me and their families, they deserve optimal end of life care and offering the gift of donation is part of that. I have never had a family become upset when we've approached them regarding donation, even when they choose not to consent. But I've had families contact me weeks after their loved one dies, very upset when they realize that nobody asked them about donation and their loved one would very much wanted to do that. I'll never forget a conversation I had with a woman. She described her dad to me and in her words, my dad was always the guy helping out our neighbors, shoveling their driveway or helping with chores when he was alive. I know he would want to help people if he could when he died but nobody asked us. So until recently, donation education was not provided to physicians during medical school or residency or other members of our healthcare team like nurses or respiratory therapists. So there's a whole generation of healthcare providers out there who just don't know that much about donation. Now we are changing that. Our system is better now and we've addressed some of those issues. It's important for Nova Scotians to understand that organ donation opportunities are actually quite rare and so we cannot afford to miss a single one. In a given year in Nova Scotia, there's about 4,000 people that die in hospitals, but less than 80 of them will meet medical screening criteria for organ donation and typically about 20 go on to donate. So if you think about that, if a single donor is missed, 5% of our opportunity is gone and four or five, six people may have had a second chance of life loss. So these are rare events that we need to focus on. Now the new law based on the premise of deemed consent means if you don't register a decision and have not told your family that you do not want to be a donor, then if a donation opportunity presents itself, you will be considered as if you've consented to donation after death. Now there are exceptions, 
in the law, new residents of Nova Scotia, part-time residents such as students or temporary workers, people who do not have the capacity to make decisions and, and those under 19. So there are exceptions for most in Nova Scotia, this law applies. Now our healthcare team will always speak to the donor family to confirm the donor's last known wish if an opportunity for donation occurs. You can register your decision to be an organ and tissue donator, organ or tissue donor, or your choice to not be a donor, opting out at any time. One of the arguments that's been made against deemed consent, which is what this is called, is that organ is no longer a gift or a donation in the true sense of the word. It may appear as if something was, quote, taken, and that's just not true. We know many people feel strongly about wanting to give this gift, and you can continue to urge individuals to make a donation decision, register it, and discuss that decision with their family. Someone who wants to give this gift can certainly make that clear, as can individuals who do not want to donate. The level of awareness and support for organ donation and tissue donation in Nova Scotia is very high. A recent research study, 2020, found 95% of participants supported organ and tissue donation, and they knew they could register to be an organ and tissue donor. Nonetheless, we understand some individuals will not want to be a donor, and we respect their right to make that decision and have developed a registry to record that. Interestingly, the number of Nova Scotians who have chosen to opt out is just over 1,300, a little bit over 1% of the population, so very low. We expect that to increase a small amount as January approaches. At the same time, we have an intent to donate registry in Nova Scotia. We have the highest registration rates in the country with about 54% of the population indicating they will have already registered their intent. And we made a commitment to educate the healthcare communities as well as the public at large with particular emphasis on historically marginalized communities. We work closely with our partners of the Department of Health and Wellness regarding this legislation. They've been leading a public awareness campaign that has included television, digital, and social media. Our awareness work continues with engagement and meeting with stakeholder groups and government partners to aid us in communicating with hard to reach communities and those with specific needs and concerns. This work will continue as January 18th draws closer and will continue long afterwards as we strive to keep Nova Scotians informed. The positive impacts of this act go well beyond the legislative work. It'll strengthen our work in the hospitals and communities across the province. Indeed, if the change was strictly legislative, it's unlikely we could expect a positive outcome. But this law has come with a commitment to support transformation of the donation and transplantation programs here in Nova Scotia. That transformation includes investment in enhanced staff education, information technology, data system updates, policy procedure renewals, and new hires for the organ, tissue, and transplant programs, as well as support for communication and campaign planning. Although the COVID-19 pandemic has slowed the process in some cases, the support that accompanies this legislation allows for hiring people into dedicated clinical and support roles that will impact donation and transplantation in Nova Scotia. In the donation program, the role of our coordinators has changed and we've increased the number of coordinators as we accept the premier's challenge to provide donation opportunities anywhere in the province. We have engaged four new donation physicians who will be based in, in the Annapolis Valley, Cape Breton, and in Halifax, and we plan in the coming years to engage several more donation physicians, all of whom will work part-time along with their regular critical care duties. We were able to secure, in conjunction with colleagues from Nova Scotia Health, the Department of Health and Wellness and other groups nationally, a grant for $1.1 million from Health Canada for a three-year research project to study the effectiveness of the implementation of the act and system changes. We know the rest of the country and indeed the world is watching what happens here. 
We continue to work with our partners to ensure Nova Scotians are provided with knowledge and information regarding this legislation so they can make informed choices. We will ensure optimal end of life care is provided to families by optimizing donation, which will contribute to more Nova Scotians being able to live healthier and longer lives after successful organ or tissue transplantation. Transformation of the healthcare system is a rare, rare opportunity. There have been and will continue to be challenges over the next few years, but I remain confident that we will be successful. We have an excellent team at Nova Scotia Health, the IWK, the Department of Health and Wellness support, supporting the organ donation program, the Regional Tissue Bank, and the Multi-Organ Transplant Program as we work towards that goal. With that, Mr. Chair, I thank you for the opportunity to appear before you and look forward to our discussions today. Thank you, Dr. Bede. That's a, quite a, a, a profound subject matter that we're we're touching on today, but definitely some inspiring words to hear from yourself and I wish you well. Uh, at this point, the committee, the way that we do the Q&A, Dr. Bede, is um, each caucus will uh, do have 20 minutes allocated, um, after which we'll go to a second round based on the time remaining. So without further ado, do I see and Mr. LeBlanc is going to kick us off for the PC caucus, please and thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Dr. Bede, for joining us uh, this afternoon to uh, start an important conversation, or rather continue uh, an important conversation on a progressive and transformative um, policy, uh, first of its uh, kind in North America. Uh, and I want to thank you as well for your 15 years of, of service to the organ and tissue donation program. You've been there, I understand, since its inception. So thank you. Um, I'm proud to be a, a registered organ donor, and, and I encourage um, encourage other Nova, every Nova Scotian to do so as well. Um, I guess, and it's the topic of organ donation uh, should start at home and and in research of this topic, you know, it was in one of the articles that should be talked about uh, around our kitchen tables with our with our loved ones so that they are well informed of our of our final wishes. Um, death and dying is a difficult enough uh, subject to be dealing with uh, on a day to day basis and, and we deal various cultures and societies deal with it um, differently. Um, so this is gonna be a massive shift uh, for, for many Nova Scotians. Uh, but I do appreciate the, the positive impact that it does have for Nova Scotia um, waiting for organ donations and the families of, of donors themselves. Um, I'd like to discuss a bit with you, Dr. Bede, uh, some of the education element and, and you spoke about in your, in your open remarks regarding uh, the public awareness. So um, I, I guess, you know, you cited, you know, TV ads and, and social media ads and things like that, but um, how far of a reach do you believe that this has um, met uh, Nova Scotians, if you could, I guess, on a, on a percentage scale? Thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. Dr. B, please. Well, thank you. That's, that's an excellent question. Um, the short answer is we're not entirely sure, but we're certainly aware of the need to connect with as broad a population as possible. And to that end, we have made a, a specific effort to address this topic in the social media realm, uh, in the digital form, if you will, uh, with television advertising, with a campaign that Department of Health and Wellness have been supported. And through that, we intend to get the message to everybody that we can in Nova Scotia. There was an initial launch of some of this in July and starting relatively soon, meaning in the next few weeks, uh, late December, January, we will have another round of, of advertising and uh, to get the message out. Now, having said that, we realize that that type of a campaign is not going to connect with everybody. And there are historically marginalized groups that may be particularly vulnerable to a, a law change, if you will, and at the same time may not be relying on these sources of information. We don't know that for sure, but recognizing that that is a possible risk, 
we have developed from its inception, we've developed a strategy to specifically reach out to leaders of these marginalized communities so that we can connect with them to inform them of what's happening and try and address any concerns that those communities might have in reference to the new law or in a broader sense, we've offered the opportunity to talk about the value of donation in a, in a more specific clinical sense. There's probably two layers to this conversation. People need to understand there's a new law for sure, because there is, but what we know from our own experience in this province and what we can learn from other countries is that many, many people know very little about donation and transplantation at all. So getting them informed about, call it the basics, is, is a priority. And then in the context of that, a conversation around the new law becomes even more relevant. So knowing that we need to connect with those people was identified as a priority on day one. A strategy to do so has been brought on board with the July blitz and the January blitz the ongoing conversations with these leaders has proceeded and will continue. And we don't stop on January 18th. We understand that this is a process that's going to require us to continue this for, I don't even know how long, but frankly, uh, as long as, as long as people are interested, we're happy to, to connect with them on that level. It's an important question and we recognize the need to continue that work. Thank you, Dr. Bede. Mr. LeBlanc, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Dr. Bede. And, and, and I guess what I'm, I'm afraid that maybe not enough public awareness and maybe not enough Nova Scotians know the, the, the details and, and I guess the pertinent information regarding this legislation, because it is a massive shift in, in the, the way that we do organ donation here in Nova Scotia. And like you said in your, in your initial remarks is that there'd be a lot of eyes uh, on our province to see how it's going to be um, rolled out. So I, I just, I wouldn't want to see um, this program and this initiative being hindered that we haven't taken uh, sufficient steps to, to ensure that enough robust awareness uh, campaigns um, have, have been done. And so I'd like to question, do you believe that, you know, previously uh, when we do our MSI renewals, Nova Scotians receive um, mail directly to addressed to them. And, and that's, you know, it, it goes over the donation process if they want to be a type one donor, type two or, or not. Um, do you believe that it, that, that's, uh, that type of, of correspondence should be um, communicated to Nova Scotians uh, in anticipation of, of these changes so to ensure that Nova Scotians from Yarmouth to Sydney uh, are very well aware of, of what the change is going to mean for them and their families uh, come January 18th. Thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. Dr. B, please. Uh, yes, I do. Again, uh, an excellent question. And to that end, we have actually developed a specific pamphlet that uh, I saw, I think the final draft of probably a week or two ago, that will be specifically dealing with that. It will be uh, information around this new law and will go out to everybody who's renewing their MSI card. And we've also tried to make access to information that people might need available by publicizing uh, what's available on our website. And we're in the process of developing uh, communication tools that will be going out to family doctors as well to serve as a, a conduit to the patients on the front line. So it's an important issue that we are addressing through that new pamphlet, but that's not the only thing we will be doing. Thank you, uh, Mr. LeBlanc, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Dr. Beat. So if memory serves me correctly, my I, I just renewed my, my health card recently. So uh, I may be only getting that, re that renewal and that information uh, in the mail in a couple of years down the, down the line. So do you think it'd be an appropriate step to ensure that, you know, it's not everybody that has access to a computer or to email or Facebook or that listens to the radio, or watch TV. So to ensure that everybody that has an MSI card in our province that has access to, to mail, that they would have that information. So do you think that we could take the, the measure now proactively um, in, in the weeks ahead and, and, you know, potentially 
shortly after January 18th to ensure that every Nova Scotian uh, has this information to their hands. Dr. Bede, please. In a perfect world, I think the answer is yes. Uh, from a practical point of view, I know the rollout strategy that has uh, this accompanying uh, new renewals is already in place. How to get it to people who, like yourself, may have just renewed, I'm not entirely sure what the process would be, but I think my impression has been in working with people at the Department of Health is that they're very interested in trying to get this done the right way and that if it becomes clear that we're missing people and that that kind of a sort of a second mail or whatever might be might be uh, worth it um, I'm, I'm sure we'll discuss it whether that's the best way to connect or not I don't know I think it's an important issue and that might be a way to solve the problem we may address it through other means for example our our strategic sort of connection with frontline family doctors is going to be crucial. So if family doctors become supporters and advocates, they're going to be able to connect with patients in their own offices, we would hope, in a way that's even more effective than a pamphlet. So a pamphlet is a tool, and it's not something we would discount, but maybe there are other things we're going to bring on board that will be able to connect with people who didn't get the pamphlet, so to speak. Thank you, Dr. Bede. Uh, Mr. LeBlanc, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Dr. Bede. And I think as, as leaders in our communities and our province that we can all be champions to promote this, this program. And I think it's um, you know, imperative that, that we do so to increase public awareness uh, through our offices and through the means that we, we have at our disposal. Um, I'd like to uh, focus a little bit on, on uh, education of our frontline workers. So was, we talked about, uh, you know, whether it be in the, certainly in, in the hospital setting with, the, with uh, doctors and nurses and RTs, um, you know, has there been any discussion in the uh, pre-hospital setting? So for, for paramedics, for example, uh, because when I worked uh, as a paramedic, it was, um, you know, a, a short discussion about organ donation and, and, and the relationship with the, with the ME's office. But, is that something uh, to improve to ensure the efficacy of, of this program um, that there's going to be um, you know robust and rigorous um, training for frontline workers in the pre and in hospital settings? Dr. B, please. We recognize this as, as absolutely crucial. Uh, we have not actualized what we think is necessary, but we have a plan in place to at least partly do that. I think you've highlighted what I would acknowledge is, is a potential gap. But I think a definition of whether we've been successful or not is going to have to await X number of months when we've rolled out what we have planned and see if there's issues. Now, I, I say that in particularly particular reference to some of the, the very frontline people like paramedics because we have a strategy to... Uh, address the needs for hospital-based uh, healthcare team members. We have uh, initiated conversations with our colleagues in family practice, and it may be that those frontline people need to have more support. Now, we recognize that there are, broadly speaking, two clinical areas where identification of the donor potential donor is hugely important. One of them is the emergency department. And we, in fact, have meetings with the uh, emergency department leaders this week to discuss these changes with the hope that we will be initiating a dialogue with emergency clinicians across the province. And that will include people like paramedics. If the feedback that we're getting from our regional colleagues in emergency departments is that there are other parts of their healthcare team that we haven't specifically connected with, we're absolutely willing to do so. You bring up a great point. It's, I guess it's obvious you have a bit of experience in this area. And, uh, and I, all I can do is acknowledge that you've identified something that we might not have um, the full solution for at this point but we're connecting with leaders in the emergency medicine field and we're absolutely prepared 
to develop something if a gap is identified. Thank you, Dr. Bede. Mr. LeBlanc, you've got about six and a half minutes on this round. Mr. LeBlanc. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Dr. Bede. Um, I guess the, the discussion that we're having right now regarding public and, and health professional awareness is, uh, you know, revolves that the intent of, of, the, of the program and, and the changes to the program um, must happen in tandem uh, with public awareness. Um, just in researching uh, in other jurisdictions, that's how the, I, I gather that the success has been uh, significant. So that presumed consent or, or uh, implied consent in this cons uh, in this uh, circumstance uh, means that government must do everything in its ability to ensure that it's informed consent. Um, I, I, as when I was researching uh, and looking into into this um, this topic, realized that the opting out process has, has started. Um, do you roughly know how if there's any Nova Scotians and and possibly the number of Nova Scotians that have chosen to opt it, opt out? Dr. B, please. Actually, we've been tracking that from the uh, from the very first day that the opt out registry was uh, was brought on board, and it's interesting because learning learning is the wrong word. Um, extrapolating from what we saw in countries like Wales, who recently brought this on board, um, we expected that we might have between five and 10% of the population that might opt out. We knew from public surveys what the support for donation was. And so we figured we might have that ballpark. Here we are a little bit more than a month away from this law coming into effect. And we have about 1300 people. So a little bit more than 1% of the population who have registered an intent not to donate and the, the uh, uh, accruement of people in that registry has been relatively constant. So it's not like there was, uh, you know, 25 per week and then some strange story in the media generated, you know, 500 in a single week or whatever. It's been a relatively small number and sort of a slow constant dribble that have gotten us to a little bit more than 1%. Now, what's going to happen in January as the law is about to, to come into effect? Maybe there'll be a bunch more people who have chosen kind of the last second. That's possible. I don't know. But our numbers to date have been lower than we expected they would be. Very cool. Thank you, uh, Dr. B. Mr. LeBlanc. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Dr. B, for for that response. And it's it's great to to hear that the expected number is, or the actual number is much less than the expected number. Um, can you gauge the the amount of, of of public outreach that's been made to the program regarding various various questions or concerns that they have? Um, you know, obviously, there's an abundance of information online, but any any direct outreach to to the program's office. Dr. B, please. We have uh, organ donor coordinators who are who are uh, vetting calls on a daily basis from the population at large. The questions around this topic get directed to them. And I know that several calls per day end up being vetted. The exact total, I don't know. The number is not trivial, but it's, it's not enormous. Um, frankly, I, I actually wish there would be more. Um, I, I don't know if that means that there are people with questions who aren't sure how to uh, they get the question answered or not, which is why we continue to focus on, on getting our message out. But to date, we have absolutely had queries from the public. I just don't know what the exact number is. Thank you, Dr. B. Mr. LeBlanc with two minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And, and I'd like to wrap, possibly wrap up on one last question. Um, so again, Dr. B, thank you very much uh, for your insight and for joining us this afternoon. Uh, in one of the articles I read, it spoke about um, how, and obviously this is in part how our healthcare system is designed through, based on our geography and, and population um, 
uh, statistics is that central uh, is based around centralization. So obviously QE2 has more specialized resources and, and personnel. Um, but they also spoke about the ability to have uh, regional experts. Um, so wondering how you envision that, that, that to be rolled out and uh, if, if there's time uh, a lot, uh, remaining, how this program in Nova Scotia is going to change uh, the landscape or, or the ability or, or the program uh, of organ donation across of across Canada. Thank you. Dr. B, please. Uh, I'm not sure how strict you are on your, your time. If because those are great questions, well worth discussing, but they're not a one minute answer. So should I just answer and keep on going or are we going to address that later? Go for it. Okay. So um, we do have a centralized healthcare system. We recognize that in a population base of roughly a million people in a, a province this size, having some expertise in every regional center is necessary, but kind of specialized stuff can only go in one place, more or less, and that's the QE2. Uh, that's why our transplant program and donation program is based here in programs like neurosurgery and cardiac surgery are in one place. That can't and won't change. However, what we've recognized for some time is that donation opportunities are happening in small centers all across the province. As you recall from my opening, the people who become donors are typically trauma patients. Well, they all come to the QE2 because of the provincial trauma program. That should stay the same. People who have big bleeds into their head from a stroke. Well, there's lots of people in the periphery who are having bad strokes. And so supporting potential donors in regional centers is something we know we need to do better. We need to get the emergency community and regional intensive care teams more informed about this because some of those potential donors may stay in regional hospitals for a period of time while some of their clinical issues get worked out. And if they need to be transferred to Halifax, we will do so. Now, interestingly, there is, and this becomes a more complicated conversation, but there's sort of two routes to donation. Neurological death, which is severe um, injury to your brain, you're, you're dead. The details of that we can go into if you want to. Uh, that's about 75% of the people who become organ donors. There is another way to become an organ donor and that's donation after cardiocirculatory death. So people who become donors through that route often have terrible injury to their brain, but not so bad that they meet clinical criteria for neurological death. Neurological death is a very specific clinical diagnosis. And there's lots of people who unfortunately have terrible brain injuries and will not have meaningful recovery, but they are not dead. Many families know that somebody in that position would choose to go to comfort care rather than being supported in a hospital environment for weeks, months, years, whatever. And so in some of those circumstances, we would support a switch to comfort care and allow those people to die. Well, some of those people might be able to be organ donors if the circumstances are right. And we are having conversations around looking at supporting what we call DCD donation in regional hospitals of this province. We're not ready for it yet, but if you ask me what Nova Scotia's donation program looks like in one or two or five years, I think we will be doing regional DCD. And that's an appropriate way to decentralize things, if you will, and to enable families who are dealing with this crisis to perhaps offer the gift of donation, but stay in their local hospital. That's something that we're talking about, but we're not quite ready for yet. Okay, thank you. I'm just gonna add three minutes to this round of questioning for each of the other caucuses. Uh, so 23 minutes on the clock for Ms. 
Coombs, I believe. If I see a hand there, please and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I know that the topic of discussion today will be the upcoming changes to the model um, at the Legacy of Life program. Um, but I'm hoping that you'll indulge me to ha while I have you here to answer a few questions on for, first about the living donation. So can you explain what a living organ donation, uh, when explain what living organ donations are done here in Nova Scotia? Okay. Uh, with, with with one crucially important caveat, I'm a, I'm an intensive care physician. Uh, I'm an anesthetist. I've been doing this for a long time. I'm pretty comfortable with that topic, but make no mistake, living donation is really something done by my colleagues. So um, so I'm happy to discuss it with the caveat that some of these things I I could mess up a little. Who can be a living donor? I'm very comfortable reporting that that living donation of kidneys is happening very regularly here at the QE2. It's a program that is based at the QE2, but it supports living donation uh, for all four Atlantic provinces. And living kidney donation in the adult and the pediatric world is a very good way to support people with end stage kidney disease if everything can be, can be arranged. There are programs in the world that are doing living liver donation. Living liver donation is not the same as living kidney donation. If you look at what they're doing with living liver donation, you're doing essentially an extended right hepatectomy. What that means is you go into the healthy donor and you take out a very large portion of their healthy liver and give it to a recipient. But healthy people have a remarkable ability to sort of regrow their liver, if you will. So living liver donation is possible. But as you might imagine, if you're going in to do a large resection of the liver, the complication rate for a big operation like that is high. And there is definable mortality. It's uncommon but there are a small number of people who have died from that operation. So if you're a dad and you need to give part of your liver to your son or your daughter or whoever, you know, sign me up in a blink, no problem. The morbidity associated with it, the mortality risk, I don't care, that's for my son or my daughter. So living liver donor programs are well established in certain centers Toronto, I think, is the busiest in the world. We don't do living liver here, and to my knowledge, there's no discussion of developing a living liver donor program here. And also in certain centers, for example, I think Toronto is also doing this, living lung has been done in some circumstances where, again, a parent might donate to a child uh, two lobes of their lung. And there is a small number of cases where people are donating these organs and they, they don't have that direct personal connection with the recipient. But when you talk about living donor programs, it's almost always kidney and in certain specialized places, it's liver and maybe lung. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Uh, Ms. Coombs, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bede. Um, what are the can, do you know what the recoveries are like for these living donations? Generally speaking, living kidney donors do very, very well. Most of the time now when you're donating a kidney, you're having the kidney taken out, believe it or not, in these tiny little holes and it's called a laparoscopic procedure. So it is an operation but um, the vast majority of people who are living kidney donors do very, very well. They recover really quite quickly and they do fine. Um, the recovery after a liver resection obviously takes a lot longer, certainly weeks. And the complication rate, my understanding is that the complication rate for living liver is somewhere in the 30% range. So that's not a trivial thing. For a life-saving operation for somebody you're close to, sure. 
but living kidney is an excellent choice for, for the right people that goes very, very well. Living liver um, might be, but I would defer to my colleagues in Toronto on that one. Thank you, Dr. Beat. Ms. Coombs. Thank you, Dr. Beat. Um, so as you said, there, there's, a, there's a significant recovery with regards to livers and uh, donations. So that would have a significant amount of time off from work, I'm assuming, the person who did the donation um, in order to make this very generous gift. Uh, to, to someone. So what kind of, what kinds of supports do you think are needed in Nova Scotia for people who decide to donate a living organ, such as a liver or kidney? Thank you, Ms. Coombs. Dr. B, please. Well, I'd, I'd love to uh, imagine a system where um, somebody that makes that kind of a gift is, is supported by whatever programs, um, exist in general for people who are sick, but, but I don't know the details, to be honest. I, I just don't. I Philosophically, I certainly think that somebody who's making that decision would, uh, would be somebody that, that I would like to see supported as they recover, but I don't know the details on that stuff. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Coombs. No, just a, just a little bit, uh, as you said, um, information. So Ontario, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan, and Quebec all have provisions that include in their employment legislation uh, protected leave for people who decide to make a living donation. The leaves are typically around 13 weeks when the possibility of extension should... Would, would you agree that this would be, you know, a, a good type of program to have in, or in Nova Scotia for living donations and for the donors? A system that supports somebody that's made that decision is something that I think is a great thing. The details around what support looks like, I think are things that I, I don't know the details on. Philosophically, as I say, the idea of supporting somebody who's made that decision makes a lot of sense to me. I just don't know what the details would be. Ms. Coombs, please. Thank you. I'll give my time to uh, Ms. LeBlanc. Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Dr. Bede. Um, I just want to start, I'm going to go back to talk a little bit about the Legacy of Life program again, and um, I just wanted to say that I, too, am a proud or organ donor, and my uh, family has made that decision. Of course, we've made a, the decision for our children, um, but I think that one of the most moving and profound moments that I've had as a as an MLA has been was the time when we passed this bill uh, the evening that we passed this bill and hearing from my colleagues uh, with their personal experiences and others who uh, joined us in the gallery that night I think it was a nighttime um, it was uh, truly very special and it felt like um, really good work <laughs> and so I thank you for your contribution to all of that um, and here we are. Uh, it feels like a million years ago that we that 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 uh, bill was passed, but we're we're getting close to it being implemented now. And so I just wanted to go back and ask, um, you know, a few more questions about the education uh, program. Um, hearing what you've said today, uh, I have to say that I'm surprised that the, the, that you know what you've reported is actually. The, the case because I frankly haven't seen any um, any literature any eaten I mean maybe I'm like on the wrong social media maybe on the wrong demographic or something but I haven't seen any ads um, and uh, I'd like to ask a few more questions about that because I I yeah I, I want to know a little bit more I mean we know for sure that um, that the success of this program will be uh, due to a robust education program. And we know that that's been the case in other jurisdictions. And so when we talk about the robustness, um, I just wanna ask some more um, specific questions. So um, you talked about social media, you talked about television. I think you said radio, but I, I'd love to confirm that. Um, so can you just give us a little recap on that, first of all, to start? Sure. Thank you, Ms. LeBlanc. Uh, Dr. B, please. Sure. Recognizing the need to connect, the communications specialists in the Department of Health have been working to develop a specific strategy. So through my lens, there's a 
body of clinical information that we would like to make sure gets out there. There's information around the law that needs to get out there. The tools, the mechanism, the sort of the, the most efficient way to do that is something that the, that the communication specialists have been very, very involved with in crafting a specific plan. And the first part of it was rolled out in July, shortly after basically um, the, uh, the announcement in June from the premier that, that January was the date. Uh, and it may have been that in the midst of, you know, everything COVID, uh, summer weather, maybe the, maybe the information that got out there didn't connect with as many people as, as would in a different universe, who knows. Um, we have continued to make information available through access on the website, but there is a specific um, launch, I guess that's the right word, and I believe it's the first week of January or the last couple of days of December, I don't know the exact date, where the sort of second focused round of this will be launched with the intention of making sure that in those few weeks between then and January 18th, the population get to hear about this. Now, why did we, why did we do it that way? Well, part of it was because from a practical point of view, you know, who has a budget to have, to have information going forever. Um, but to be honest, in my mind, I was really struck by several conversations I had with colleagues in the UK who have, as you probably know, Wales brought this on several years ago. Now the United Kingdom is. And we've been in contact with the people who've sort of walked this walk on the other side of the ocean. And, and Phil Walton, who's an outstanding guy, um, basically made the point that people didn't really pay attention until the deadline was getting close. It's, and, and the analogy he used, which almost everybody here I think can relate to, is we all know what the deadline is for paying our taxes. It's the same every year. How many of us do it in January, right? And so his argument was that if you want to put your message out and have it connect, then the timing is relevant. And so that flavored the strategy, which is that we need to connect with the population sort of in the beginning, but that focused message needs to be re-delivered in around the time that the law is about to come into place. And there is a strategy so that come January, we will be, we will be seeing and hearing this. Now in my mind, um, I'd love it to be like giant billboards everywhere and, and uh, you know, we're, we're blitzing the universe the way these, you know, Americans put, you know, political ads out. That would be great. That's not going to happen. I know that. So uh, we, will, we will trust that the communication experts have a strategy that works. It's been funded and supported, but I think that that's just the first part of this. I didn't mention it before, but it's interesting in, you know, I've got two teenage daughters, which reminds me that I'm getting old, but also reminds me of the influence of social media. They don't watch TV. So an ad on TV is like, forget it. But Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever, whatever the new platform is, uh, is something that connects with them. And, and there is a strategy exactly to connect with that universe. And we've been working with a research group. Tim Caulfield is a social scientist uh, lawyer in University of Alberta, who's got a, a communications research group. We've been working with them since this project started and they are very closely tracking social media in Nova Scotia to just identify, you know, is the message getting out, is the wrong message getting out or whatever. And we're using that kind of information to help flavor how we might approach things. To your point, I don't think our message has been as broadly distributed as we'd like it, but see if you say the same thing on January 19th. Thank you. Am I allowed to go? Yeah, sorry, I was hitting the wrong button there. Ms. LeBlanc, please. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, well, gr you know, great point. And I think that that's probably true. I mean, um, you know, people forget what they've seen three months ago, but when it's right in front and, and there's a, and I know there's an art to that kind of um, release. I will say, um, you know, I will say in terms of hard to reach populations that um, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give you a little example from my uh, community, which in, in which there lives many, many marginalized folks and vulnerable folks, very hard to reach folks, people without internet access, um, uh, high levels of poverty, low, some low levels of, of literacy. Uh, and back in the first wave of the pandemic, uh, there was an outbreak of COVID-19 that happened. And so a testing site was, was stood up at the local community center. Uh, and, you know, within days, um, there was like a massive committee that was, you know, service organizations and people from public health and my office and the local counselors and everyone was meeting daily about how to get the information about this testing site out to those folks who don't have who don't have access to the internet. And I'm telling you, it was a real struggle. And it got, to, we, I was going around to apartment buildings and handing posters to the, to the property managers to get them to put them up in the, in the windows of the, of the, um, of the uh, buildings. And uh, we have a tons of rental properties here. And, and even then, I think that, you know, the word did not get out as much as it, it should have the the numbers at the testing site were quite low in in, in general i think um and so i just want to use that as an example of how really tough it is to reach certain populations um and especially populations who are um sometimes um you know um uh cautious of the medical system as it were uh and so i just want to i want to put that out there i i wonder um i was wondering if Perhaps uh, some of that campaign coming up in January will be direct mail. I think that that might be, not that I want to tell people how to do the jobs, but uh, I want to tell people how to do their jobs. Um, but direct mail, I think, would be really useful, but very simple uh, messaging as well. Um, so wondering if it might include direct mail, wondering if the strategy might include um, languages other than French and English and um, wondering if there will be culturally sensitive uh, education in, in, that, in that information that is, that is put out. Mm -hmm. You make excellent points, and I completely agree with basically everything you've said. Um, one of the things that I've dealt with with colleagues around the world who, for example, I, I do a lot of work internationally on this topic, and, and um, some countries are all in, some countries think it's not the, the way to go. But one of the things that people bring up is that there are communities that we don't historically connect with and will they be well served by this? It's a valid point and it's framed our strategy from the very beginning. For example, we have through the Department of Health uh, specifically connected with marginalized communities, the leaders of those communities to try and make them aware of this. Now, how well that gets dissipated amongst those communities, I actually don't know, but we've consciously tried to connect with the leadership in those communities to try and do so. I know that we are, uh, part of our, our advertising will be French radio and Arabic radio. Um, the other interesting thing that we've done, and this highlights the fact that you know, people are watching us, Within one day of this being announced by the premier, I got a phone call about an opportunity to apply for funding for a Health Canada research grant because the opportunity to study what we're doing, what's working, what doesn't work is something that is a valuable, rare opportunity and the world wants to know. Well, we can talk more about that project if you want, but but activity three, which is one of the ones I'm a co-lead of, specifically focuses on knowledge and attitudes amongst healthcare professionals and the public. And I'm working with Dr. Robin Urquhart, who's a qualitative uh, researcher at Dow, to specifically meet in uh, survey settings or small group settings or focus group settings with historically marginalized communities. It's been part of our mandate from day one to connect with those communities, see what we can learn from them and see if, if we're closing the loop. And if we are, great, good for us. If we're not, what can we learn from those communities? What do we have to change? I honestly don't think we're gonna be where we need to be on January 18th, not a hope, but are we on the journey to success? Absolutely. Are we committed to continue that? Because we 
identify gaps that, that are important, I'm absolutely on board with that. But I don't know that we're going to be as successful on January 18th as we'd like to. Whether direct mailing connects, uh, it might. I don't know. Thank you, Dr. B. Ms. LeBlanc with just under three minutes, please. Well, I guess then um, I have lots more questions, but I guess I'll ask, it, you know, if we're not there, if we're not where we need to be on January 18th, then, then what does it actually look like? Um, you know, when when you are presented with a with an instance where someone could be a, a an organ donor and the family, uh, you know, is uncomfortable with with that uh, question, or I mean, and again, I'm I'm in full support of organ donation, but I know that there are people who are are scared about it and worried about it. What's it going to look like if it is the law, but the education campaign hasn't rolled out as well as it needs to have? Then then what happens on the ground? Dr. B, please. Well, let's let's. I'm not sure I would um, agree that it hasn't launched out as, as well as it needed to. It just might be that that in spite of what we've identified as our need, maybe the need is exponentially bigger than anyone could have known. I'm prepared to acknowledge that 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 might be the case. But practically speaking, at the bedside, will we encounter a family that that? just knows nothing about this, it's possible. Um, what I think gets potentially lost in this, in which I'm, I'm, I'm just, I just have to sort of state is, I know what it's like to be at the bedside with families in distress on their worst day. I've dealt with it many, many, many times. Our objective is to support the family through the worst day. As, as a colleague told me, our objective is not to increase donation. Our objective is to, to enable families to make their best decision on their worst day. Mm. But when we do it well, that is almost always a consent for donation. And that will be the philosophy that we continue to bring to the bedside with the law or without the law. But the question does change. When we go there on January 19th, the question is, can we talk about what your husband or your dad's wishes were? That's a different question from, do we have your permission for your husband or your son to donate? It is a different question and it leads to a different conversation. And I think our healthcare team at the bedside will negotiate this new reality with a desire to increase donation for sure, but the real desire is to make sure we're supporting this family on their worst day. And I'm confident that most of the time that means they say yes to donation. Thank you. Mr. Chair, you're on mute. Ms. Miller from the Liberal Caucus, please. Thank you. Ms. Miller's on mute as well. Ms. Miller is also on mute. So much more to talk, I didn't need on mute first. Anyway, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. B. Uh, this certainly is something very near and dear to my heart. As Ms. LeBlanc said, it was probably one of the most emotional and satisfying days we've ever had in the House and because there was you know, all party support for this bill and everybody had a story to tell. And certainly my family has been one of those families that is on their worst day. Uh, our son was killed. He was a police officer killed by a drunk driver 16 years ago and had a, he was declared brain dead, neurological death. And uh, he had never signed a donor card. We didn't know what he had. We'd never had that conversation with him. And, um, you know, we just thought, you know, he's, he was the guy who believed in second chances. And so we thought, what a waste. He's 26 years old, you know, very, very healthy. How could you let that hope be buried with him? So we were very fortunate that his organs were all able to be donated except for his lungs uh, because of his lung capacity and, and, I can tell you in the days and years following, it certainly brought us a lot of peace. And we actually heard from some of the donor families, 
So where I want to go with my first question is uh, with donor families. You know, um, just recently, to turn it back here 16 years later, uh, my husband three years ago had a cornea transplant. Uh, about three months ago, he had a second one that failed and then it actually was fortunate enough to receive a third cornea, which is still a work in progress, but it's coming along. And, you know, I want to be able to reach out to some of those donor families the same way that people reached out to me. And I just wonder, um, you know, what you would advise, is there going to be an expanded program that way? Because I think when people know how it's impacted your life, their gift, how it's impacted your life, your loved one's gift, um, what, what can we do to bring more awareness there and have that happen more? Thank you, Ms. Miller. Dr. V, please. Well, thank you for your story. First, you know, I, I've dealt with a lot of donor moms and, and your voice will echo a million times louder than mine. Nobody can speak to this the way a donor mom can. I can, I can be part of that a hundred times and I don't know it the way the mom does. And so your voice and, and the tragedy that was the death of your son, I think is, is part of the reason we do this because in the middle of what is nothing but bad news, maybe something good came from it. And I hope 16 years later, you feel that way. So, so how, do we, how do we get this message out? Well, part of it is, is what we're doing in the context of this whole sort of transformation of the donation program. We wanna make sure that, that the system we have is as good as it can be, and it wasn't. It had to be changed and improved. Um, the opportunity to give a voice to families and to maybe enable them to connect with the recipients whose lives got changed is something we've known has been a, a, an issue historically. And in the new law, actually, one of the things that changes in the new law is that there's going to be a provision that enables donor and recipient families to connect. There's certain circumstances and so on, but the bottom line is going forward, uh, donor families and recipient families can get connected and in a specific sense. We have an annual celebration and I, I would suggest that anybody that isn't sure if this is the right thing to do should show up at the gift of life celebration, which we hold annually, which is our attempt to thank donor families for the decision they made. We give them a little memento, but it's really about them connecting with other families and hearing recipient stories. And if you don't think that the gift of donation has helped donor families, you need to go there and listen to those stories because their voice is, is real. Um, so the program has to get as good as it can get. The value of that connection is recognized and supported. And the voice of people who choose to, to use it is something that I think we should support going forward. Thank you, Dr. B. Ms. Miller, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Dr. Deeds. Really appreciate those words. And uh, one of the things with our experience too, you know, as soon as they told us that Bruce wasn't expected to live, they asked us for his organs. Literally, he wasn't declared brain dead yet. Uh, but I think they had a good idea, but they weren't quite saying it yet. And they said, what do you think of organ donation? And I found that I know it has to be done soon, but I just found that a little too early, you know, it was like pushing it a little bit. And I have another uh, lady that I know from the Mothers Against Drunk Driving organization, that's where I got involved. And uh, she actually had her death notification phone call. And the second sentence after your son is dead was, can we have his organs? Mm -hmm. And she was furious. She hung up on them. And for years later, she regretted that she had said no, because, you know, and because, you know, she would have liked to have known that his organs were out there helping somebody, you know, are there also provisions? I, I think this is going to take away some of that conversation because people will have more conversations about organ donation and what they want. But uh, do you think there needs to be a little bit more put into also uh, the training for nurses or whoever is in that hospital to be able to approach a family in a, in a gentle, more gentle, kind way. 
Thank you, Ms. Miller. Dr. B, please. People watching this may think that that's a planted question because it's such a perfect question. Um, you have just made a perfect argument for why we need the different system than we had in the past. We, as I alluded to in, in my opening remarks, we have a system where there's a whole generation of healthcare practitioners who just don't know much about organ and tissue donation. And so the story you provide um, doesn't surprise me. It disappoints me, but it doesn't surprise me. There's very clear evidence that the way we do this makes a difference. For example, if you look at consent rates around the world, on the low end, we're in the 20 something percent, on the high end, we're in the 85%. And there are clearly factors that influence whether somebody says yes or no. The way a family is approached absolutely influences uh -huh. whether they say yes or no. And it's not just the, the, the uh, when, it's the how. And this gets back to what I alluded to. How do we help families make their best decision on their worst day? And so the, to do this, we actually have to have trained professionals who know how to do this and have them supported by a system that has gotten them where they need to get. That is not our past, but it will be our future. We have um, changed the expectations of frontline people. We're asking them simply identify a potential donor, then phone us. That's it. You did your job. We'll take it from there. We don't want, I, I, you know, I, I tell this to the residents every year. I have one or two cases a year where I've given the talk around donation and the residents hear it. And then a few months later, somebody stops me in the call and, hall and says, oh, Dr. B, you know, we had this case in Emerge the other day. It was really awful. Um, it was sad. It was terrible. The patient died. But I, I remembered about donation. So I asked the family. They said no, but I asked. They think success was that they thought about asking. My definition of success in the future is they thought about this patient as a potential donor and they phoned us so that the right people who are trained and who are available can, can support that family through that journey. That's what our program will look like in the future. That's not always what it looked like in the past. And the investment made in changing our program has included increasing number of coordinators, changing the way they're trained, establishing donation positions across the province, uh, supporting the system. So that experience you describe, I hope will be infrequent in the future. Thank you, Dr. B. Ms. Miller with about 14 minutes to go. Please unmute your uh, microphone. All right, again. Yes, I, I'll just have one more question and I'll pass it on to my colleague, Ms. De Constanza. Um, yeah, it's funny how life has gone. It, it's almost come full circle again. My husband uh, has just recently been diagnosed with chronic kidney failure and he's not a candidate for, he was just informed too that he's not a candidate for transplant. So we're gonna be dealing with that whole issue coming up in the near future. But, um, you know, and our granddaughter who is an 18 year old university student actually offered to donate a kidney. And I just couldn't be more proud that she saw nothing wrong with doing that. That she, you know, not that we were, that my husband was gonna accept a kidney from her. I don't think he ever would have, you know, if he had been a candidate, but it just speaks, I think, to the whole outlook and how people think about donation. It's like, if they can, they should. So I was really proud of her for doing that, even though it ended up, you know, that it wasn't something that he could receive anyway. And I had a conversation with a gentleman after this bill was brought in the house and he was angry. First time I've ever seen him angry about anything government did. And he said, I have control over my body and my organs and nobody should tell me what to do. Now I expect that he will probably, you know, register as, you know, saying that he wants to opt out. Mm -hmm. but he still believes in organ donation, but he just wants to make that choice. So I wonder how many people on that, you know, on that list of people that are opting out basically want the same thing. They just want to make that final choice when the time comes, but they just don't want, for lack of a better word, big brother telling them, you know, what they can do with their body. 
Thank you, Ms. Miller. Mr. Bead or Dr. Bead, would you like to respond? Uh, I think that that sentiment in its various forms is something we have to acknowledge. I think we have to respect the right of people to hold that opinion. But there's a few things I would point out. One of them would be, did they get to that place based on the wrong information? So if we inform people of sort of what the real lay of the land is and they still say no, well, that's their right and we'll respect that. In many, many cases, the reason they're saying no is because of some crazy idea in their head. Like, you know, if, if I do that, somebody's gonna sell it to, you know, some rich guy. I believe me, I've heard that story and transplant tourism in this world does exist. Well, if somebody thought that the government, quote unquote, is going to take my organs, sell it and help deal with the provincial debt, I'd probably be against it, too. So if that's where you got to because of crazy information, then our obligation is to get them well informed. At the end of the day, if that's just the way they see the world, we respect it. We give them an opportunity to register to opt out. If you're really worried that you don't want the government telling you what to do with your body, then you have ample opportunity to make it crystal clear that I think this is important and I have registered that I want to be a donor, period, full stop. We will still have an opt-in registry. It's just that we also have an opt-out registry. The law comes into effect where there is no clearly defined decision on the part of the patient. So for all those people who insist on personal autonomy, great, exert it. Register that you do absolutely want to be a donor and nobody will take that from you. Thank you, Dr. Bede. Ms. Costanzo, please. Thank you, Dr. Bede. Honestly, this is just like that night at the legislature. We're almost in tears, uh, absorbing more than we could ever imagine. I am so grateful to be an MLA today, just to hear all this information. We're given so much information as MLAs and it is truly wonderful. Uh, I just have two um, questions, but first I want it in, in the same line about education and where um, uh, may, I was so excited when you said that uh, 1.1 million was given to research because Nova Scotia is starting it. And I know the rest of the country is watching and would want to, to learn from us. And I know we do the best job. I've worked as a medical interpreter for 20 years. I, the two most important things that I've learned uh, is having two patients and following them for over six months to almost a year who had two kidney donation within a week of each other. I actually brought them to the house. That was what Ms. Plan was referring to. Um, it was incredible what I learned that it isn't just an overnight thing that you, became, you can become a recipient. It takes three to six months of preparation to get your body ready for it. And then there's another um, six to eight weeks of recovery and uh, do, um, organ uh, rejection that the, the, the time and, and the effect that it has on the family and the loved ones who are watching all this is incredible. It is a huge, um, uh, it will be in, in my life and I was just the interpreter so I can imagine what it is to the mother and the parents of that child or the, the child themselves or the adult themselves. What I'm thinking is, my question here is, the fact that we're gonna have a lot more organs, I hope, uh, because of this, will it make the, and, and to, the difficulty was, in my, with, from what I understood is finding the right match. So now that we're gonna have more organs, Will that make the preparation time and the recovery time uh, shorter and better? Or those organs can only last 24 hours or 48 hours. Is that going to matter? And Thank so you, Mr. Costanzo. Dr. Bead, please. Well, the uh, sort of workup time and recovery times are not going to change appreciably because that's sort of physiology. That's just kind of the way it is. But you, you point to a very crucial reality, and that is that for whoever's out there who needs an organ, um, there's a waiting time while, while you deal with your health issues awaiting the right match. 
And clearly, if there are more donors, sorry, more organs donated, then the chances you're going to get the right match go up. And so I would love to think that with a wildly successful program, with many more organs available, wait lists will definitely be decreased. That's our aspiration. Will we get there? Um, you know, I, I sure hope so. Uh, that's my expectation. Um, I, I'll share with you something that, that um, I thought I had emailed you. And I, I'm hesitant to bring it forward because it's extraordinary news, but boy, did we set ourselves up. When we started this conversation around the need to increase donation in Nova Scotia, we had historically been like the little engine that could. I loved, I absolutely loved going to national meetings where we had by miles the smallest program. It was me and a couple of other people and we had the best donor rates in the country, loved it. And we did for the better part of a decade. And then other programs put in things that we learned in other countries the world were successful. Um, they brought those things on board. They got very successful and we drifted to the middle or even the bottom of the pack. We had 16 donors in 2017. That was our low point. And the trend was, was down. We started to make the case, we got to do something different. Well, we've dealt with this by getting support to reboot the entire program with this law. In 2020, the whole world has dealt with a pandemic. Everything has gone sideways, including donation and transplantation across Canada and across the world. And we're bringing in deemed consent for the first time in North America in the middle of a bloody pandemic. Now, on the outside looking in, that's bad planning, but it's the cards we were dealt. Now, having said all that, we're not even finished 2020 and we've had 32 donors right now. We have a donation rate that is the highest that's ever been recorded in Canada. And we're doing it in the middle of a pandemic. And we're doing it in a way that I hope is sustainable. I hope we've set a new benchmark. So getting 20 donors per year was our 10 year sort of normal. I'd love to think that going forward, 30 or more donors per year is our new normal. And that's what, that's what the change in the system, as we get ready for this new law, the law is on January 18th, but the transformation of the system has been happening for the last 18 months. And I think we're seeing a tangible benefit at the bedside. We have, we have more donors per million this year than any jurisdiction has ever recorded in Canada. And we're doing it in the middle of a pandemic. That's kind of crazy, but it's good. Um, I hope next year is as good, who can tell? But um, if we can be that successful, I'd like to think that the people in our communities won't wait as long. That's my objective. The other thing that we didn't highlight is tissue donation. You know, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of tissue donors we miss in this province. And about ballpark 80% of the tissues transplanted into people in this country are imported from the United States. They cost, I don't know how many millions. We're missing hundreds of tissue donors. And so I hope that in our new world, organ donation is our new normal and tissue donation dramatically expands as well. Thank you, Dr. B. Misty Costanzo with two and a half minutes, please. So maybe it will not end up to be a question, but just quickly, I always look at the multicultural and the immigrants and how they think about it. I come from Iraq, my husband is Italian, and it's unheard of that I want, I was the first one 20 years ago to register to give my, um, but my husband, no, because in Italian, a wedding and a funeral is the biggest thing in, in, in the world, right? They, they celebrate that in a different way than we do here. Uh, so for, for me to convince him, and I actually, we joke in my family that I've donated, but he has the right at the end to say no. Mm -hmm. And that is, to me, is wrong. <laughs> but it is, how do I, you know, <laughs> my, actually the premier said, Rafa, don't worry, you will be um, nagging him from up there. 
if he, if he did that to you. Uh, it was just a, a joke about this, but it's serious because for me, how can I reach all these mul different multicultural people who uh, and religions that see this as very different than what we the, the average Canadian sees it? How do we educate them? And as you were speaking about this research and maybe some doctors who are from those, I call it the 10, um, everything that we did with interpreting was the top, the 10 top languages by uh, percentages of population that we have. In this province, we have different languages needs than for BC, for example. So maybe in each province, in our province, we know what's the top 10 languages or the, the top 10 uh, immigrants from which countries. And we have a doctor from those countries that speaks to, go in and speak to them. Because there's no point if everybody, you know, those parents or those uh, immigrants will say no when they're faced with it because they, they come from that background, as you said, either your organs are donated because of money or uh, because of this. We come from a different country with misconceptions that doesn't exist here. Mm -hmm. Can we help increase the numbers of new immigrants donating? I'm not sure. Dr. Bede with 30 seconds on the clock. <laughs> Pressure. We uh, completely agree. Our strategy has been to connect with the immigrant community specifically, and we're doing that. Uh, I actually had a meeting with uh, the imam at the uh, Central Mosque uh, in Halifax, and we're developing a connection with faith leaders. Dr. Urquhart, my colleague with Activity 3, actually had a meeting yesterday with faith leaders from across the province. We've committed to having an ongoing conversation with the uh, Islamic community. Uh, and so we have recognized it as a need. We are on the path towards addressing those historical gaps and recruiting people from those communities is one of the ways we're gonna be successful. Dr. Babar Haroon, who is my colleague, uh, is the one that connected me to the to the imam. We'll do more of that. Thank you, Dr. B. Miss Adams, perhaps? Six, six minutes for this round, folks. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Dr. B, for being here today. Um, you will get a sense from everyone here that we are enormously proud of the Premier and this government for bringing this forward. Um, I was actually sitting in the legislature um, knowing that a friend of mine's daughter had died waiting for uh, a lung transplant after being on the list for over a year and a half. And my first thought was, this is coming too late for her, but uh, hopefully moving forward, it will help so many more people. Um, I used to work in the transplant team in London, Ontario as a physiotherapist. And I know, and I also worked in ICU, and I know that sometimes other allied health professionals are part of the conversation, um, sometimes with family who are hoping for a miracle that their family member will recover, but they don't. And so I'm wondering if you can tell me, I know that I as a physiotherapist and uh, Colton LeBlanc as a paramedic have received no communication from our allied health professional bodies so I'm just wondering if there was any attempt to educate the allied health professionals in the province, because there's, you know, a good hundred thousand of us out there floating around who could be carrying the message and saying, hey, you know, you could have this conversation with your family or to call the transplant team. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Dr. Bede, please. Well, yeah, again, an excellent point. Uh, we have focused on our, our physician group in the ICUs and emergency department and the nursing uh, community within those as our first priority. Uh, the need to connect with the ancillary healthcare communities is, is important. And to be honest, uh, th that's maybe one of the specific things I'm gonna take from this call. Maybe, maybe we hang up here and we specifically look at who in those communities we have not yet con connected with. Because I, I agree with you. If, if you've worked in the ICU, you understand it really, honest to God, is a team sport. And there are a lot of very talented people that all contribute to a good outcome. And getting them all on the same page makes sense. Physicians spend 
way too little time at the bedside. You know, if I'm with a family for 10 minutes, the nurse is with them for 12 hours or the physio might be with them for an hour. Like kind of makes sense that everybody's on the same page. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you very much for that. Um, when we started the, the transplant unit at University Hospital, I was a supervisor there. And I know that we did an impact analysis to see how many more of the allied health professionals do we need? How many more wraparound services do we need? And there was also consideration way back then, I won't tell you how long ago, but it was many years ago, where there was mental health services for the family members, both of those receiving the organ, as well as those who have given up the organ. And I'm just wondering, uh, especially given that we're in the middle of a pandemic, which has already stressed uh, everyone out, if there has been an impact analysis done on the number of allied health professionals, including mental health services, that will need to be added to the program as you start to do more organ uh, transplants. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Dr. B, please. Uh, short answer is no, there hasn't been an impact analysis. We don't have a specific number, but we have recognized for some time that family support can't just be, uh, you know, sort of a relatively nondescript letter a few weeks later that says, thank you, your loved one has helped so-and-so. So in fact, as part of our complete reboot, what we have established is a family support liaison who is now part of the Legacy of Life team. They, that role didn't exist before, but this is part of our new improved system. And uh, our role going forward with family support will be to address just some of those issues, as well as to help connect donor and recipient families down the road. So we've recognized it as a need and we have something that resembles a solution in place whether we need to do more or different things, I'm open to looking at that as it, as it evolves. Thank you, Dr. B. Just a quick reminder to mind our hands on our microphones. I think Ms. Adams, you might be shifting some papers or something like that. Ledge TVs inform me that we're, we're catching some feedback. Sorry, go ahead. One minute to go, please. Thank you. Uh, last question is, I know right now we're moving some patients from acute care beds into a hotel. Um, because there isn't enough capacity for the rooms in uh, the current acute care beds, especially in Metro. I'm just wondering if you can tell us if you have considered the increased need for hospital beds and whether that's going to impact um, the uh, other surgeries that might be happening in uh, Metro specifically. Dr. Bede, please. In a specific sense, uh, we have addressed the impact of increased donor numbers, uh, mostly on our surgical colleagues. And so the, the total number of, of increased OR times or post-op beds or clinic slots is something we have tentatively modeled if we get wildly successful. And again, as part of the law, we garnered support to reboot the donation program, as well as support for the multi-organ transplant program and the tissue bank. There is uh, support for an, a transplant nephrologist. We never had one before, we will. Another liver transplant surgeon, we have three, we need more than that for four provinces. And nursing and ancillary staff in the clinics, uh, all of that is part of a three-year model to increase support for what we hope will be a lot more patients. Now juggling OR time, there's just no way that that's easy. And the only way we can do this responsibly is for everybody to acknowledge that a donation and transplantation opportunity, that's just a life setting, uh, life saving, you've got to do it now kind of thing. And, and, and that's what happens. It's, it's akin to you know, we juggle the schedule, you know, within, you know, the limits we have, but nobody says, you know what, we're really sorry, but we can't cancel a list. We make it happen and we'll continue to make it happen. Sometimes it's difficult in the moment, but, but it happens. Thank you, Dr. B. We'll move to our NDP colleagues with Ms. LeBlanc, please. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And, um, 
I just want to go back a little bit on the um, the public education strategy that we were talking about before. Um, interesting to hear you say that there there is an opt in and an opt out. Um, so I'm just wondering quickly if you can sort of uh, like so for instance I've signed my my uh, donor card uh, mm -hmm. when I get my when I get a renewal whenever that is I'll continue signing it. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm not supposed to talk yet, sorry. All right, the answer has been yes. Ms. LeBlanc, keep going, please. These are some uh, um, short snappers, Mr. Chair, just so you know. And so, and so if I don't want to donate, I'm going to go to the registry, opt out, and I'm going to get a new donor card, or sorry, a new MSI card that says I don't want to donate. Is Dr. that correct? Dr. B, please. Basically, yes. You'd be registered in the opt-out registry and your MSI card would reflect that. Yes. Yes, it will. Thank you. So, um, so then I guess my question is, um, how, like, what measure are you going to use or, or, uh, or the Department of Health and Wellness going to use to figure out if we're on the right track with getting more people uh, like that we, that we know that the new program is working? So if we don't know what we don't know, um, then it's hard to know if we're reaching all of the people that need to be reached about, you know, it, with the education program. So I'm just wondering um, how the the communication program will be, or the education will be being tracked, measured, or assessed. Dr. B, please. Well, one, in fact, again, one of the one of the dramatic changes from our historical uh, donation program has been the establishment of a basically a database with IT support. Uh, and as part of the Health Canada project, we're doing a deep dive on what's happened in the last five years. Every potential donor chart in the province being being uh, reviewed uh, with the establishment of a baseline for system performance, if you will. And so we're going to have a pretty accurate snapshot or as accurate as possible, a snapshot of where we were and a commitment and a tools to define where we are and where we're going and the comparison will tell us if we're if we're successful i can tell you that if the past 11 months have been any indication our conversation with colleagues across the province has led to referrals of potential donors that we weren't getting before um, Healthcare teams are recognizing this, supporting this in a way we haven't seen before. We are not getting a whole bunch of nasty letters from people or that say, you know, somebody approached me for donation. Our system is working better. Mm. The, it's important to point out that the metric that a lot of people want to focus on and define this as a new, improved, successful system is the number of organ donors went up. And clearly that's hugely important. But if the donors numbers didn't change one bit, but we had a better educated staff, we had evidence that families were treated in a better way and supported around end of life, then even if donation didn't go up a single bit, that's value added. The fact that we are on our path to defining that, and by the way, we've almost doubled our donors, like that's huge. Thank you, Ms. Long, please. Thanks. Um, uh, and I guess, big question, will or can the public strategy that has been um, created, can it be shared with the committee and the members? Mr. B, Dr. B. Uh, I, I, well, from my point of view, as I sit here, I'm totally okay with that. Uh, I don't know what the rules are, but it seems to me like the strategy that the Department of Health Communications people have um, it makes sense, I think. From my point of view as a clinician, I'm really in, in, focusing on the fact that, that we've got a message to get out. We have groups that we want to connect with. And that's what I, I think is happening. Whether there are, are you know very specific ways to do that, that's the expertise of the communications people. And I have no problem having people uh, look at that, but that's, that's probably a conversation for somebody else. Uh, Ms. LeBlanc, please. How much time, Mr. Chair? One minute. Okay. 
Um, okay, so uh, with with one little minute, um, um, you know, hearing what you just said about about the outcomes and you know uh, what success looks like. Um, even though that is the truth, I'm wondering if you do have some targets, uh, like, you know, when, when this, <laughs> you know, are you hoping for a 25% increase, 50% increase? Do you have anything that you, that you have benchmarks for? Dr. B, please. I absolutely want us to have by miles the best program in the country. And I think we're gonna, I want to have a program that's made up of a whole bunch of well-trained, excellent clinicians and support people, we're on our way to doing that. I wanna have donor numbers that everybody else in the country thinks we made up because they're too good. Uh, and that's, that's where I wanna be. Realistically, I mean, that's a little tongue in cheek, but that's not really tongue in cheek. I honestly think we can, we should, and we will be there. But in, if you wanna learn from the rest of the world, what we have seen is that if you are very successful a 20 to 30% increase in donor numbers, which is the money distills this down to, is what has happened in successful programs. So when we developed our initial targets, we were at 17 donors per million. And we really, really thought that if we do a lot of things right, then we hope we're going to get to high 20s in five years. That's what we were really looking at based on models from around the world. Now, having said that, we're less than a year into the real work and we're at about, well, we're, you know where we are. We're 32 donors already. And so I don't know what the future holds, but I know that this has been the best year for donation that has ever been recorded in Canada and it's in the mid of a pandemic. Now, how does that happen? It happens because we're starting to change culture and we're starting to get a community in our province informed about and supportive of organ donation. We got a lot of work to do. Now, having said all of that, which is wonderful, that's not my target. If you look at the best performing programs in the world, Spain, some of the organ procurement organizations in the United States, they're in the high 40s, 50s. So why can't we be there? Thank you, Dr. Beat. Um, Mr. Horn, please. Unmute your microphone, sir, please. Thank you. It's inspiring listening to you today to answering these questions. So many of the questions we all have are quite similar, but they're different. Um, I'm interested in myself personally. Um, I'm a little older than most people here today, and um, I have diabetes type 2, somewhat under control, as best I can. And I'm just wondering, uh, what kind of tissues would I be able to uh, donate if, uh, if that ever comes to? It will someday, of course. Dr. Bead, please. Well, it's interesting to note that there is no age limit for organ donation, and there have been 90-year-old livers successfully transplanted. Livers are remarkably robust beasts. So um, an elderly patient who is in generally good health might very well be assessed to be a multi-organ donor. But as you get older and as you have more comorbidities, of course, the chance of being accepted is, is decreased. Uh, but the take-home message is that it's a specific assessment. And I've had patients who've had basically everything wrong you can imagine with them. You know, um, terrible heart, terrible lungs, on dialysis, nothing's working. And that patient donated a liver that was perfect. So take home message is even with comorbidities, the assessment is made on an individual basis. And when one or more organs don't work, perhaps there's still something that will. As for tissue, there, um, there's slightly different rules and they actually do have an age limit for tissue donation, which I believe is 70. But for organ donation, we, do, we, we acknowledge that as you get older, it's a little less likely, but there's no specific age cut off. Mr. Horn. Yes, um, 
Dalhousie University uh, produces medical doctors and specialists, I guess, also. And um, you, is their role changing or will change because of uh, this new act that's been in for a year? Dr. B. Well, the graduates that, that will populate hospitals and clinics across Nova Scotia hopefully are going into practice with a bit more education around this topic than I was, because we're introducing this importance of donation into medical school. It's included as part of their training during residency, and we are part of the network of continuing medical education and will be in the future so that our clinical colleagues will go into their clinical universe better equipped. I hope that they understand that this is part of optimal end of life care and that that's an important part of taking care of their patients and so that they bring it up specifically. I don't know if that'll happen. I do know that some of the groups on the, on the sort of the gatekeepers, the emergency physicians and the doctors in the ICUs, uh, their role will change. We will be asking them to focus on the identification of the potential donor and we're developing an education platform to help them get where they need to get. Awesome. Mr. Horn with our last question of the day, please. Okay, I understand the federal government is considering similar to what Nova Scotia has been doing. And I don't know much about it. I just read it a little bit this morning. I'm wondering if you are familiar with it, that they're going to be bringing a new act forward or a bill forward. Dr. B, please. I'm not aware of anything federal, but I do know that as we've talked about this over the last 10 years or so, colleagues across the province have had similar conversations, even if the governments in those provinces haven't gone there yet. Now, as soon as we in Nova Scotia had this law, I know that there was serious conversation in Alberta, in Saskatchewan, in PEI, I think in Quebec uh, about bringing this on board. And so we are being watched as a province. And if we can show that we have brought this on board and that we are in a better place, I would expect that you will have a lot of interest from your political colleagues on how you did it and what they can learn from it. I would not be surprised if we're successful uh, to find that we are the start of what could be quite a change. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. B. Thanks everybody for a wonderful uh, conversation today. Dr. B, this is heavy stuff, but important work. And it's uh, truly amazing the work that you're, that you're, that you're doing on behalf of everybody. Um, did you have any closing remarks for the committee? Well, I, I, I do, I have to sort of thank you for taking the time to bring this topic to this committee because it's not very often that this topic gets the, you know, attention that it has in the context of this. And that's a good thing. The, the point I need to make, and I alluded to it some time ago, ICU is a team sport. Well, I can tell you that I'm the one sitting here but there has been a ton of people who have supported this at the Department of Health. Um, and, you know, Lisa and, and Nancy have been the primary leads down there at the level of, of NSHA. Um, Vicki and, and especially Cynthia have been my, my primary advocates, you know, Kitty with MOTP and then, you know, Harold and, and um, in, in tissue bank, um, we've got people at the IWK uh, who have been working tirelessly on trying to make the system better. We've got my donation colleagues and critical care colleagues. We are evolving into a real team that can support our frontline day-to-day -day people who are in legacy of life. And we've got a, a bunch of coordinators there and Ellen is our new manager and they're, I mean, this is a good problem, but they're busting their tails. This is a crazy busy year and, uh, and an amazing number of people have really risen to the challenge. So I get to sit here and we have a conversation, but, um, but there's a ton of people in the back that, that are really doing the heavy lifting. 
Awesome. Yeah, that's important to acknowledge those folks that are working outside of uh, the space that we're in today. So thanks again, Dr. Bede. We're going to buzz through some committee business here. You're welcome to stay and join us for it if you'd like. It's but, not uh, even tempting, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we'll see you again another day. Uh, okay. Happy holidays and uh, happy new year. Thanks for your support. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Right. Okay, folks, uh, a little bit of committee business. I'm just going to buzz through here and uh, start off just based on some some of the dialogue in the committee uh, with, with the committee's consent. Um, I think it might be appropriate based on some of the commentary to A, uh, send a letter to all three of our caucuses giving the information that we would have received today. Um, just about the program and the timeline of, around January. Um, and just without telling people what to do, encouraging people to share it, to align with the timeline that Dr. B referenced today. As well, uh, Ms. Adams made a, a positive comment about, um, I guess, perhaps reaching out to allied health professionals. Um, I think that it might be appropriate that we as a committee write to the comm staff um, to to say can we can we connect with the allied health professionals? I know Dr. B had indicated that he was going to do it anyway, um, but with the committee's consent, uh, perhaps we can draft those two letters of, and accompanied information. Is that okay, uh, Mr. LeBlanc? I'd like to speak to the to the second point, if I may. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and I was. You know, I guess if, if you want to make it a motion, is that something that you'd want to entertain or? It's up, it's up to you. I mean, I, I, I just think with the committee's consent, we can, we can move forward and it'll be a letter drafted uh, by the committee clerk that addressed uh, two caucuses and to the comm staff at health separately. Yeah, so certainly I support both initiatives and and you know sharing in that information with our caucuses is, is very important but i i wouldn't mind making uh the second point a, a motion to ensure because we i think after today's conversation and, and even previously we all want all this we will all want this program to be successful uh we recognize that the program may one day uh, affect ourselves our loved ones or, or our family um there's been discussion and quite possibly some misinformation or insufficient amount of information uh, to whether it be healthcare professionals that should have this information or everyday Nova Scotians are going to be impacted um, by um, by this you know progressive and transformative uh, change come January 18th. Um, so I I think it'd be incumbent on us to uh, write to uh, the comms team uh, for DH or Department of Health and Wellness. Uh, to ramp up their efforts, so, you know, there's there's a good discussion regarding a plan, but we're not sure what that's going to look like in the next six weeks. But I'd like to see targeted um, um, correspondence, whether it be you know a letter or a pamphlet or some sort of correspondence to every Nova Scotian that has an MSI card. Um, just just for the sake of acknowledging the clock, Ms. LeBlanc, can you give can you make a motion for us to extend? I don't know, maybe ten minutes. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, I'd like to make a, a motion that we extend the health committee uh, 10 minutes to ensure that we can uh, complete the uh, business. Is it, is it agreed, folks? Thank you. Um, so yeah, to, to that point, I mean, I, 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 I defer to the committee, but I think that we need to be mindful that the comm staff is entrusted to do their jobs. Uh, and while we um, can make recommendations and present them with information. I think we need to be mindful that that uh, they're doing that good work on behalf of Nova Scotians. And so if we present that information, perhaps they have the ability to use it as they see fit. Uh, Ms. Adams, please. Thank you. And I appreciate that everybody today shared that they want this to be successful, but we also want all, all Nova Scotians to know about this. And I think the consensus is that the communication staff have not quite met that bar that we would have expected at this point, because it isn't just that you need to let me know that I am now an automatic organ donor. I have to also have the conversation with my partner and my children and my family um, so that I can mentally, as well as pragmatically, 
have a very difficult conversation with family. So I think that it's important that, you know, we encourage them to do as much as possible given the short time frame that's left. Ms. Costanzo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, what I was really hoping is to have time to ask questions, but I didn't. Uh, then what I wanted is their communication team, the team that's working with Dr. Bede to produce things that are easy for us as MLAs to share. That was my intention is to ask him to send us things that we can forward through our social media because each one of us have two to 5,000 people that we can reach, but to make it in a way that it's a conversation you know, just uh, start the conversation with a little video. They're very good at that. That is what they know how to reach people, but to prepare it for us as all MLAs that we can use to our- um, Okay, our thank, you. thank you everyone. I think we've got the essence of the, oh, Mr. Irving, please. Uh, thank you very much. And thanks for sending uh, the motion. I think the intent of the motion uh, is fine, uh, but I, I do want to recognize, I think the chair touched on this. Uh, you know that they are ramping up public awareness leading up to the 18th, so that work is happening. Um, and I also want to recognize that we are not the ones that have a good sense of the resources that they have and the full strategy that they've got for communications. Uh, so uh, for us to in, imply that we are instructing the health minister to do certain items I'm a, a little concerned with. Uh, so I'd like to propose an amendment that to, to say, move that the committee write the Minister of Health and Wellness and encourage to ramp up public health awareness and education on the changes. So I'm just add, adding uh, the word encourage in there. Uh, I want because I feel we should recognize that they have much work underway and are best uh, positioned to determine what, wh whether, uh, or best positioned on where to put their uh, finite resources. We have to remember communications in health right now uh, are doing this in a, in a pandemic. And I think we need to, to recognize that and, and uh, I think with the word encourage, we can convey the interests of the committee, but not uh, be uh, so presumptuous that we know better. Okay, Ms. LeBlanc, did you have something final to add to that? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with the motion and the amendment. I think, you know, words are important. Um, and I think Mr. Irving has a point there. Um, but I guess I just wanted to circle back to when I asked uh, Dr. Bede about sharing the strategy with the committee in the first place. And, and he responded that, you know, in his mind, um, that would be fine, but he that up to someone else. So I just wanted to clarify if we were going to make that request to the department as the committee to have the communication strategy also just shared with us as it is. So it may be, I may not be speaking to this motion or the amendment, but I just want to get that on the table. Yeah, okay, so I th so to to Mr. Uh, Irving, I think Mr. Irving made the official motion, if I'm not mistaken. It, might, it wasn't my intention to, to make a motion initially. Um, uh, Ms. Adams? So uh, Colton had introduced the motion and there was sort of an amendment to it and then a discussion about perhaps adding to the motion to request that the communication strategy be sent to us, which could all be wrapped up into one motion that Mr. LeBlanc started. So, okay, my my initial commentary was to try to make this less formal than it's turned out to be. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry for attempting to do that. Um, so uh, the, the initial motion, Mr. LeBlanc, could you clarify what that was? Uh, so is that we, as a committee, uh, write to the Minister of Health and Wellness to ramp up public and health professional awareness and education on the changes to the organ and tissue donation program in Nova Scotia effective January 18, 2021, including direct mail outs to ensure the success of the program. And that's without Mr. Irving's amendment. So the amended motion, the amendment would be to reframe, to say, we would encourage the 
the department to I thought maybe Mr. Irving, you can clarify that. Uh, yes, I, I'm just asking to uh, put into that motion that we write to encourage uh, the, the department to wrap, wrap, ramp up public health. So uh, just a little softer language there, uh, recognizing that they uh, are, uh, well, I've, I've already spoken to it. So okay. if you could vote on the amendment and then we can so see Ms. whether Ms. LeBlanc, so LeBlanc like wants another amendment. Yeah, I, I think what I'd like to do is button those two up and then if we have a subsequent motion, that if that's agreed. So to the amendment, uh, do we have any further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary minded. Mo uh, amendment is carried to the initial motion. Uh, is there any further discussion with the with the amendment? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary minded nay. Motion is carried. Thank you, everybody. Um, now, Ms. LeBlanc, did you want to make that uh, a formal request? Sure. I guess I'll say um, I make a motion that the committee uh, request the communication and public education strategy from the department be shared with the committee. Thank you, Ms. LeBlanc. Is there any discussion? I'll uh, second the motion. Mr. I'll second the motion. Okay. Uh, hearing that, is there any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary minded, nay. Motion carried. Okay, I'll do my best to buzz through the stuff that's on our, on our list here. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so our, uh, the organizational chart from the Department of Health and Wellness was emailed to members on November 27th. Is there any discussion on that item? Uh, I have to bring to the committee's attention that the directive to re to request uh, quarterly updates to this list will expire along with committee business. Um, so uh, we'll need a motion to continue that protocol if uh, if re if requested. So, Ms. LeBlanc, I'm seeing uh, a nod for that motion or sorry, Ms. Adams, excuse me. So I I would like either yourself or myself uh, as the person who moved it originally to make that motion that this be an ongoing um, uh, activity that the health committee received this update every uh, quarter um, indefinitely, well, permanently, not on an annual basis, permanently. I would I would probably add with within the um, and actually can I can I bug you Miss Adams to just table that motion for a sec and make another one to extend it till to extend the meeting to a quarter after. I would be happy to make a motion to extend the meeting until quarter after. Thank you. So, so moved. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Very minded. Thank you, folks. Motion passed. Um, so the. I believe you, uh, Ms. Adams had indicated that, I think she used the word permanently. Um, I wanna be mindful that um, we have, um, we have to consider, uh, I guess, future general assemblies or pro prorogation. So um, I, might, I might defer to our uh, clerk or alleged council on kind of what the, the protocol should be here before we, uh, as as we incorporate the discussion here. So perhaps uh, Mr. Head. You've got to get, uh, got to get yourself. I'm, not, I'm there you not go. totally sure what I'm being asked now. Um, the, Mr. Head, there's, there's been a request to continue with quarterly updates of the Department of Health's organizational chart. And given that we're uh, or to experience a prorogation, um, just looking for some direction on on what to do or how to frame that request if uh, if we're 
if we're intending to continue that practice as a committee. I'm not sure that there's Do I have to can you hear me now? Because I have to adjust my sound. It's when I have it adjusted so you can hear me, it's too loud in my ears. Um, I'm not sure that there's really anything that the committee need do. This is part of an ongoing practice of the committee um, that I think just carries on. I don't I don't really I don't see a this is not like the agenda and, and the business before the committee. I think it's more of an ongoing practice, but if the committee wishes for insurance to to restate it um they can but i i don't i don't i don't see a, a pressing need for the committee to really do anything okay um uh miss d Costanzo? i'm just wondering if once a year would not be enough then four times a year that's a lot of work and a lot of paper i don't know if, if it is a lot of work on the department or not but once a year for staff changes uh, it's probably in uh, could be enough. I'm not sure. Thank you. I, I would note uh, that we I think this was a decision that was made previously, um, Ms. D. Costanzo. So, um, Ms. Adams. So there's over 20,000 people who work for the Nova Scotia Health Authority, and they change on average 10% a year. So they are constantly changing who are in these management positions. So I, I think a year is far too long. It won't be useful information uh, for us to go through it. So um, for those of us who refer to it on a regular basis, uh, once a year is not sufficient. So since they've been able to do it every, every quarter, I would like to recommend, I, I didn't realize that we needed to keep renewing this, but, um, but the chair indicated that it was going to expire, which I didn't realize there was a year time limit on it. So therefore, I would like to make a motion that the organizational charge from uh, the Department of Health and Wellness and Nova Scotia Health Authority continue to be submitted to the Health Committee on a quarterly basis. Hey, Roger that. Is there any discussion on that motion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Contrary minded nay. Aye. Motion, motion's carried. Thank you. Um, so our January meeting, uh, uh, the, clerk, the clerk's already arranged for the witnesses. Uh, actually, you know, I'm going to defer. Mr. I, I, Chair, I, I, Mr. Chair, I put my hand up has. three times. I have a motion as well. Yeah, sorry. I'm just trying. I'm also trying to get through committee business here, Ms. D. Costanzo. So thank you. I, I acknowledge uh, Ms. D. Costanzo. Has the time expired? No. Uh, at quarter after, folks. So quarter after. So I, uh, I'd like to make, um, I'd like to move that we add a following witness to our next meeting. The topic is continuing care, uh, the Deputy Minister of Health and Wellness, and or a designate, Mr. Kevin Oro, uh, and a representative from the Unifor to our next month's meeting. Ben? Uh, Mr. Horn, please. I'm, I'm not on this. I have a motion that I'd like to get in before we're over. Okay, on this subject, uh, discussion, please. Ms. Adams, please. Um, well, in an interest of not running out of time, can I make a motion that we extend the meeting by another 10 minutes? Okay, yes, and that will be the, the, fi the final uh, extension, folks. Um, Agreed. Uh, so the... But I do have a co comment. Ms. Adams, please. So I just want to be clear, I, I'm not opposed to having anybody coming in as guests, but you mentioned something about um, possibly Unifor. So I'm just wondering, you said one or another, but there's union representation and non-union representation. Are they both being invited or is one a substitute for the other? Uh, Ms. D. Costanzo, could you clarify that please? Sure, they are both being invited. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 I'm very minded, nay. Motion carried. Uh, Mr. Horn, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I move, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I move that the pursuant to Section 36 of the House of Assembly Act and pursuant to the Resolution 2, Section A1, 
passed unanimously on June the 16th, 2017, that this committee meet after the House is prorogued for the life of the General Assembly, abiding by the public health protocols and continuing with virtual options if required. So moved consistent with some of our other committees just to maintain uh, operations uh, while House is being prorogued. Any discussion? Uh, Ms. Adams, please. I second the motion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary, aye. 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 Motion's carried. Um, so uh, the last item I have here is just the um, uh, just the acknowledgement. I think we've we've agreed that uh, in the in Ms. De Costanzo's motion that the we'd add witnesses. The intention is to move forward with our agenda as as expected. Uh, our clerk has already arranged for the uh, witnesses to be present. So with the consent of the committee, we'll we'll uh, move forward with that uh, witness and have an agenda setting meeting. Um, uh, yeah, Ms. Cavanaugh, when, when will our next agenda city setting meeting be? Will that be in the January meeting? No, we have several um, several topics left on the current roster. If you want to continue with that, okay, sounds good. Well, we we can play that by ear, but for now, we just want to continue with that that January witnesses planned. Is there any further discussion, folks? Hearing none. Thank you for your patience, your cooperation, your effort today. It was a pretty cool subject, and uh, we've got lots to talk about on that front. So. Uh, without any further business on our plate, uh, our meeting's adjourned for the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.